Good morning, it's Monday, December 1st, 2014, and this is your Morning Edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, the case against Mubarak was dropped in Egypt yesterday. Are protesters heading back to the streets? For the first time in its history, Israel marks a national day to commemorate the Jewish exodus from Arab countries. And later on the show, people around the globe mark the World AIDS Day. Good morning, I'm Alid Grober and we begin this morning in Egypt, a day after the court there has dropped the case against former President Hosni Mubarak over the killing of protesters in 2011. Demonstrations are taking place in universities around the country. To hear more about it, we're joined in the studio by former Israeli ambassador to Egypt, Ambassador Yitzhak Lebanon. Good morning uh, to Good you. Good morning, how are you? I'm uh, doing very well. Thank you uh, for uh, coming in. Thank this you morning. for inviting me. So before we hear from you on this matter, let's uh, watch this report on the latest in Egypt. <laughs> An Egyptian court on Saturday acquitted former President Hosni Mubarak of both murder and corruption charges. Mubarak was accused of killing hundreds of demonstrators during the 2011 revolution that ended his decades-long rule. Six of Mubarak's aides, including his interior minister and his two sons, were also acquitted. Mubarak was also cleared of graft charges involving a gas deal with Israel. Outside the court, security was tight as supporters and opponents of Mubarak gathered for the verdict. It's not a wish, it's more of an expectation that President Mubarak will be acquitted. He's a first-class nationalist and is a military school graduate. He freed Taba. What happened during January 25th, it was a loss and we call it a loss. It was a conspiracy to take down not only Mubarak, but Egypt and the whole Arab world. Mubarak was flown to the court in a Cairo suburb by a helicopter from a military hospital. Though acquitted, Mubak will not be released because he is serving a three-year sentence in a separate corruption case. The judgment was greeted by cries of joy by Mubak's supporters in the courtroom. The former president, his sons, and the other defendants smiled broadly and Mubak waved to his supporters. While Mubak's supporters called for celebrations, the Egyptian army was deployed in all Cairo's main squares to prevent clashes between supporters and opponents of the former president, including the families of the dead. Also joining us now is uh, I-24 News Middle East analyst Ali Wakid. Good morning, morning to you, Ali, as well. Uh, but I'd like to, to begin with you, Ambassador Lebanon. Uh, were you surprised at all by the decision yesterday by the courts? Well, in the charges in that court, you had two charges, two different charges. One concerning the gas. Uh, that Egypt uh, sold to Israel. And the second one was uh, what happened during the revolution, you know, in Tahrir Square and the killing of the youngsters. Mm -hmm. For the first part, the gas, personally, I was not surprised. Because this actually. Is the, the corruption charges that. that no, they claim that uh, Mubarak is sold the gas to Israel in a lower prices than the regular prices. Okay. And we knew that this is not correct, even when I was there. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we knew that the price is much higher than the gas, you know, sold to Jordan or to Qatar. So in, in that regard, I think that I, I was not surprised. The, on, the, on the first, on the second charges, killing the people, look, there is a big question mark. We have still more than 800 people who have been killed in Egypt during that period of time. Uh, somebody killed them. Mm -hmm. So if Mubarak says, I did not give the orders, and the Minister of the Interior says, I did not either, and the police say, I did not shoot. So who killed all okay. these youngsters? Right. So this has to be uh, investigated. I don't know how they will do it. I hope that there will be a kind of a committee of investigation just to know precisely who did it. There are some assessments, some rumors. Uh, started with Omar Suleiman at the time who passed away that they intercepted the intelligence, the Egyptian intelligence. They intercepted phone calls between Hamas and Gaza and the Muslim Brotherhood. And we knew later on that few people stormed the prisons and they freed people from Hamas and Hezbollah, including, by the way, Mursi also. Mm -hmm. So if you will combine all together, today people are saying that this is probably the Muslim Brotherhood and the Hamas who should that people, but this has to be investigated. Of course. And does this uh, affect in any way uh, Sisi? Look, 
everything you know happening in Egypt that will have some impact. But I don't think that this will put in jeopardy, uh, let's say, his regime, mm -hmm. because he's really supported by the majority of the people. Uh, secondly, it is just obvious that the uh, parents of the victims will be will be angry. Mm -hmm. uh, the opposition will be also angry. The Muslim Brotherhood will be angry. But still, I don't see the masses going into the street in order to topple, let's say, uh, Sisi's regime. Right. Uh, the army is supporting Sisi. Uh, a, a large segment of the population is still supporting. And look, we have to take into account that uh, Egypt is facing a serious problem, the problem of terror. And, and, and Egypt has to deal with that. Yeah. Let's turn to Ali and, and uh, let's, let's hear your take on, on what happened in, in Egypt yesterday and what might happen in these next few days. Well, yesterday, in my opinion, the fact that secular liberal, uh, liberal uh, youngsters and students went down to the streets and especially uh, to the universities uh, reflect the fact that not only the Muslim Brotherhood were not satisfied with the uh, verdict regarding uh, uh, Mubarak and his uh, sons, but also uh, other parts of the Egyptian uh, population, the young that saw that uh, hundreds of Egyptians were killed and nobody is, according to the Egyptian uh, law, nobody uh, is due to pay the, uh, the price and mm -hmm. to be uh, responsible for this uh, for this killing so this is raising a huge uh, question mark about the uh, fairness of the uh, uh, Egyptian uh, uh, legal system exactly. of the Egyptian uh, regime and the fact that the by the way there were uh, a third charge that the ambassador did not mention and this is the charge of the corruption there was the charge of the gas to Israel the charge of killing the uh, demonstrators and uh, a third charge of uh, gaining a fortune from uh, illegal business that uh, Mubarak and his sons uh, uh, did. They were in the uh, in in jail. There were ten persons, mm -hmm. three charges from the 10 persons and the three charges, none of the 10 persons, the 10 persons were Mubarak and his son, both his sons, three, the Minister of Interior and six of his assistants. None of the 10 persons were uh, found uh, guilty. None of the uh, uh, charge was uh, uh, accorded to none of the uh, accusers. So we have 100 percent innocent. Right. And what although, I was... Although Mubarak is still serving time currently, until when it's because still being another decided. Because another affair that he was uh, found uh, guilty for also uh, for corruption. He was sentenced to uh, almost uh, four years, and now we are hearing that his uh, lawyer is demanding to be uh, uh, to uh, bring to an end the the prison uh, part because he is almost uh, three years in uh, in jail. Now the question, uh, Oded, is and you mentioned how this uh, will impact uh, uh, Marshal uh, Sisi. I don't think it will have an immediate and a direct impact, but the number of 100 percent innocent, as I was told yesterday by analysts and, and people in Egypt, remind them from the 100 percent Mubarak winning the referendum and 100 percent Mubarak winning the uh, presidential. And these uh, numbers were uh, a, a red signal to even those who are anti-Muslim uh, Brotherhood. Of course, of course. All right. Let's uh, now uh, go to uh, Egypt. And uh, joining us from Cairo is uh, ARA Middle East correspondent Jacob Verchefter. Good morning to you, Jacob. Good morning. So what's the uh, atmosphere like in, uh, on, on the streets of Cairo this morning? So this is not 2011. And uh, Cairo is business as usual. The only thing is, if you get closer and closer to Tahrir Square in the Egyptian Museum, you'll see more and more security forces. But it's business as usual here. I'm right next to a public school. The kids are at school. People are going to work. I think the eye today is going to be on universities because yesterday, as you guys mentioned, there were widespread protests at Egypt's universities. And um, even the state-owned uh, news website, um, Al Ram, des described the demonstrations as a university uprising. Uh, those demonstrations happened at El Azhar, at Cairo University, at Ain Shams, at Helwan. All those campuses witnesses, witnessed students chanting against the police and military rule. And Students showed humor in their waving of zucchinis, chanting kosa, um, which is an Egyptian slang term for nepotism and for favoritism. All Still, right. it needs to be remembered that university administrators throughout Egypt are really committed to the current government. Um, President Sisi has made a big stress on including university administrators and presidents and top faculty in these kind of think tank committees that are all about rethinking the Egyptian economy. And the government is trying very hard to focus the population here 
on huge development projects like, for instance, uh, the expansion of the Suez Canal, a possible right. bridge right. across the Red Sea to uh, Saudi Arabia. So they're 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 trying to trying to uh, I, I guess the the not so nice word is co-opt, but the nicer word is integrate the universities <laughs> into. Uh, a, a vision of what CC is going to accomplish during his presidency. Right. So do you think that they'll continue to allow these protests within the universities? I believe that there'll be a limited amount of protests uh, allowed for another couple of days. But I think at any whiff of Muslim Brotherhood or Islamist um, involvement or symbolism at these demonstrations, it's likely that there will be violence. Right. Are these the same protesters that we've seen in 2011, or is it a new generation? Well, you know, I think they're the younger brothers and sisters of the folks you saw in 2011. I, I think a lot of the original protesters, the youth of, of Tahrir Square, look, there's a cadre of leadership that's still in prison, we need to point out. Mm -hmm. And there are people who have moved on and, and have done other things, um, including leaving the country or including working on, on on their own private businesses. Right, I see. Uh, Jacob, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to speak <clears throat> to us this morning. You're welcome. Uh, back to you, uh, um, Ambassador Lebanon. Uh, he mentioned, uh, Jacob mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood. Where do you see them uh, on this matter? Well, they are very active. They are very active, uh, even in the universities, by the way. This is not only the liberals, you know, the youngsters. There is mm -hmm. a lot of Muslim Brotherhood within the university. We have seen this in the last year, year and a half, uh, you know, against Sisi and against the coup, what they call the coup that Sisi did uh, to take uh, take power. Mm -hmm. So we have seen them. Uh, two days, uh, you know, after the uh, that Mubarak was acquitted and all these uh, people were acquitted, uh, the, one of the imam of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, declared, you know, a fatwa, which is uh, a decree, a religious decree, saying that it is permitted, you know, to kill Hosni Mubarak. Uh, we have seen it, you know, during Sadat time, you know, when yeah. the Gamaat al-Islamiyah say that, look, so, look, I think that uh, Mubarak is, 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 is passé, is finished. Yeah. I don't think that he has in mind, you know, to go back. Uh, There's to, no to comeback power. from Mubarak. I don't, I don't think absolutely. Look, he's 86 years old and he's sick. And more than anything else, I think that he is physically and psychologically tired. Yeah. He's Although, fed up, as you know. Ali said, there is sort of a, a feeling as if this is a return of the old guard, you know, with 100% acquittal, look, 100%. You, you cannot deny it, you know, if he was, you know, acquitted. And, and in my eyes, uh, what is worst is not that Mubarak was acquitted, but has, uh, oddly he was acquitted in the Minister of Interior. I know him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, was, he was a very, uh, let's say, harsh person. He was new, you know, to be, to be uh, very, very difficult, you know, with the people. I'm talking about the other six who helped Supported him. Supported. Right. I mean, it was, you know, with Amn al-Dawla, which is the kind of the security, the internal security. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, ter terrible, those, those people. So I, I, I'm, I'm not surprised, you know, that people are not happy with this. But I think with Mubarak is over. Uh, the only thing that I see this morning, that people started to think, to think, that in 2018, probably Jimmy, mm -hmm. his son, will run for presidency. This will be the return of the old regime. Now, well, in my yeah, opinion, uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi will not allow not Jimmy and not anybody uh, else uh, to uh, uh, be competing uh, him. But uh, although maybe uh, Mubarak is not uh, back, but the spirit of Mubarak era is definitely uh, uh, back and by uh, and by uh, force. We should uh, see how the media is uh, is acting. The media that is uh, uh, putting on itself uh, a self uh, censorship mm -hmm. on one hand, lack of criticism in the media, the fact that the opposition is almost absent from any uh, uh, talk shows or any uh, shows in uh, in TV uh, showed that the spirit of Mubarak era is back and back by force. Now, I wonder what uh, influence uh, will this have on the international level, on the relations of uh, 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 U.S., Egypt relations with Israel, perhaps? Well, with Israel, I think that the uh uh, we should we should not we should not deal with this. You know there is nothing to know with Israel. I mean we are not we are not in this um, 
Uh, let's say in these uh, charges, this, this is an internal. Uh, this is an uh, internal Egyptian def matter. Definitely, it is an internal. The fact that they use the question of the gas to bash Mubarak and his people, mm -hmm. this is something completely different. But Israel is not is not you know part of this absolutely, and we should we should remain you know away from from all that. The second point, uh, I don't see yet. I don't know if this will happen this morning or not. But I don't see any reaction, official reaction, coming from the West, mm -hmm. no, from the United States, uh, and and from uh, from Europe. And the third point, I think that it's easy for the West. Uh, probably this is the way they will take and it. Leave it there. They will say, look, this is an internal issue. Uh, this is the tribunal. This is the legal system. We do not interfere. And by the way, it's very easy to the Egyptian to say that. To the Americans, Which was not don't the interfere. Case back in 2011, when the protests no. just broke, no. uh, the world but look, was there's happy a difference. to interfere. There is a difference in 2011. Uh, all, all, all uh, people, you know, from all venues and all the, the society, the fabric society, went into Tahrir Square. Yeah. It was not only one part. It was not only the youngsters or the liberals or the Muslim Brotherhood. It was everything. Yeah. People came, you know, with their family, with the kids, with the babies. So it was a huge, let's say, a protest against Mubarak. Look, at that time in 2011, sincerely, the people were, f sorry for the word, for, for, were fed up, you know, with Mubarak. They wanted him to leave. Right. That's it. Go away. Yeah. And this is the, why they use the, the word, you know, Irhal. Go away. Go away. That's it. Leave us alone. Yeah. I don't think that this has changed in the mind less than those who support him. Uh, Asif Ya Rais, you know, I'm sorry, President, who are supporting him. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that, that there is the return of this era of the ancien regime. Right, right. But I think that we are in the era of Sisi, which is more accurate. I see. And in the Arab world, Ali, what sorts of reactions are we seeing, if any? And uh, yeah, of course, in the Arab world, there is uh, uh, the Al Jazeera and the supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood on one hand, and on the other hand, the media uh, that is loyal to the uh, regimes and the uh, regimes are not, of course, in favor of this kind of uprisings and of uh, uh, protests. They are in favor of the uh, stability. And Abdel Fattah Sisi, whether you like him or you don't, mm -hmm. he is a symbol of stability uh, uh, in Egypt. But I want to refer to one uh, point. Mr. Ambassador said that the majority of the Egyptian Population support uh, uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi. I want just to mention that the result, the, part, the level of participation in the election was uh, 32 or 33 uh, percent of the Egyptians who went to uh, uh, to vote. It is true that Abdel Fattah Sisi won the uh, majority, but still the third, only the third of the Palestinian and uh, the Egyptian population went to the uh, polls to uh, to vote for uh, for the, their president. Now, in uh, if you if you can uh, uh, if you watch the uh, the Arab world, you see. Some Saudi and the Saudi uh, camp who are very uh, sympathizing the uh, the verdict, who are uh, sympathizing and supporting uh, the regime. And of course, the young segments of the uh, Arab world who feel very uh, disappointed. We saw uh, the elections in Tunisia that will probably, most probably, bring back to uh, power a, a very senior member of Zainal Abdin Ben Ali uh, uh, cabinet, uh, Sepsi, who is now uh, leading in the uh, in the uh, presidential and on the uh, other hand Mubarak where uh, was cleared of all uh, 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 charges and this is where the uh, uh, 2011 or even to 2010 is is going back to the old right. system so it's two steps forward one step back uh, but, but, by the way yes. uh, about your question you know in the Arab world I think that the Emir of Kuwait called Mubarak to congratulate him hmm. um, and even uh, if I'm not mistaken I saw something coming from Bashar al-Assad that he will be ready, that he will be judged by the Egyptian tribunal <laughs> because they they free everybody. Look, uh, we have seen it, I told you, you know, before we started this mission, you know, I think that we have started and we have seen it in the in the past, in the history, in all the revolutions. If you take the, the, the Soviet revolution or the, the, the French revolution, we have seen up, ups and downs. There, there is the revolution period. Later on, there is something which is you don't know in French. In France, it was the terror time. Mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt, it was the Muslim Brotherhood and the military system. And back, you know, you see some people, uh, like in Tunisia. In Tunisia, they did it in a very decent way. They did it by way of democracy and elections. They did it in the in the parliament and the presidency. Right. But PCC is 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 one of uh, uh, right. Ben Ali. It doesn't mean that Ben Ali is now leaving Saudi Arabia and coming back. But you know, people who who, who belong it still to that, can happen, maybe. I, I don't think so. Now, we have to bear in mind always, and don't forget it, that Mubarak served for 30 years. So all the people we see now in politics, in economy, in culture, in, in everything, 
those people were under his time. Of course, you know? under, so everybody, under his wing. So yeah. whoever will come, you will Has always say, to you Putin. will say always that, that he was with Mubarak. <laughs> he served for 30 years. Of course, of course. Uh, Ambassador Lebanon, thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on, the Islamic State has uh, launched an attack over the weekend on the Syrian border town of Kobani from Turkey. Ankara denies the IS fighters passed through its land, and uh, Ali Waqid is uh, uh, gladly still with us to, to put things in order. But first, Ali, let's uh, watch a report on the latest. Come back to you. Yet another worrying development in an area that has brought little good news of late. This footage, released by the NGO, known as the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, is said to show an Islamic State militant emerging from a grain storage facility and firing at an unseen target. What is out of the ordinary here, however, is that these grain depots are on the Turkish side of the Syria-Turkey border, near the embattled town of Kobani, according to the Human Rights Group. A Kurdish official located in Kobani noted that IS snipers were using the grain facility as a base and described their presence in an area patrolled by the Turkish military as a scandal. Turkey has so far not reacted to the claims. In addition, on Saturday, four Islamic State terrorists blew themselves up in Kobani, one of them detonating a car bomb at a border crossing adjacent to the town. In this case as well, the observatory claimed the vehicle came from Turkish territory. The Turkish government dismissed this as a lie. Some of the Kurds in the region have gone so far as to accuse Turkey of cooperating with the Islamic State. While this remains in doubt, the accusations are unlikely to improve relations between Turkey and the West, which have become strained following Turkey's hesitancy to confront the Islamic State directly. Past statements that Turkey would come to the aid of Kobani or at least provide bases for Western forces have been shrugged off by the Turkish authorities. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has stressed that he wants a commitment from the West to act against the Assad regime, with the installation of a no-fly zone being a priority. It's not something that we're looking at right now. As you, you, you can look back, though, at other operations that either NATO has conducted or were conducted, uh, multilateral operations with no-fly zones. They are, uh, a no-fly zone is, is a resource-intensive uh, undertaking. Meanwhile, the U.S.-led coalition's airstrikes continue in Kobani, with reportedly 50 IS militants killed since Saturday. With an increasingly complex reality taking shape in the region, an end to violence remains out of sight. So, Ali, uh, decipher what's happening in Turkey for us. Yeah, for, for the moment, uh, there is no official uh, confirmation uh, uh, to the fact that the Islamic State fighters had shoot from the uh, Turkish part of the uh, borders, but this is no uh, secret that uh, the Turkish are still playing a double uh, uh, game, a double uh, role. Uh, uh, they want uh, the Islamic State to be uh, uh, distanced from the uh, Turkish uh, policy, but they know that the Islamic State is the main rival of their enemy, of the regime of Bashar Assad. So they don't have really, for the moment, uh, uh, an interest to see the uh, Turkish, uh, to see the Islamic uh, State uh, disappear, unless the international community, the, inter the international uh, coalition, will declare that the next step, or simultaneously, there will be strikes, there will be a campaign against the regime of, uh, uh, of Bashar uh, Assad. Now, now uh, the Kurds are there in between uh, uh, the, the Turks and the Islamic state and they're uh, they find themselves uh, hit from from both exactly ends. and and we still remember uh, uh, the footages where we uh, saw Islamic State fighters and Turkish uh, soldiers uh, smoothing chatting exchanging uh, smiles so it is not a huge surprise if uh, uh, parts of the uh, uh, Turkish security system part of the Turkish military is giving uh, uh, support logistic uh, to the uh, to the Islamic State and as you said in between there is the uh, Peshmerga, the, the Kurds forces, that Turkey was obliged uh, uh, to allow them pass into their uh, territory uh, to try to defy the Islamic State. And in and the question is, who does, uh, who does the uh, Turkish uh, more uh, accept, the Kurds or the uh, Islamic State? And we cannot be—and uh, there is huge doubt what 
I, I personally believe that in bo between both sides, Erdogan prefer the Islamic uh, prefer the Islamic, the Islamic state. state. The uh, Kurds have no on their goals. Uh, the uh, um, the uh, Assad regime is not a factor. They don't fight uh, uh, Assad. They have no problem with Assad. On the contrary, uh, Assad, because of his uh, problem at the beginning of the uh, Syrian uh, civil war, actually gave them uh, uh, freedom. Right. They started to organize their committees in the uh, Kurds' party, and he used the. Kurds as a card against the uh, uh, the Turkish. So uh, now the uh, the Turkish found themselves in between uh, 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 Assad and fight the Kurds fighters who are fighting enemies of uh, uh, of Assad. And for the moment, the uh, U.S. and the international community is not meeting the Turkish uh, demand to put Assad on the uh, uh, table, to of put course. Assad on their uh, list, and to start uh, striking the Islamic State. And it comes at a moment where everybody is talking about about a counterattack that is prepared by the uh, Islamic State. We know that the oil prices are getting uh, down the incomes mm -hmm. of the Islamic State, who is controlling uh, oil uh, 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 fields, are uh, going down. And we are hearing, for the moment, rumors that Turkey, uh, Qatar, and others are supplying the Islamic State with finances and with and with arms. And in the last uh, days, we saw anti-craft missiles uh, shot from the uh, Islamic State fighters towards the uh, uh, Syrian regime craft. Now, uh, other rumors are also circulating uh, um, uh, involving what was uh, happening in Kobani. One of uh, Jill Rosenberg, uh, Israeli uh, um, Canadian, if I'm not mistaken, who was who was rumored to be to have been kidnapped. What, what can you tell us? Yeah, about for it? the moment, still on this issue, also there is no uh, official confirmation uh, from the uh, Islamic State. And I guess that if uh, Rosenberg is in the hand of the uh, Islamic State, there will be very uh, shortly coming a video of uh, uh, Rosenberg with the kni famous knife of the mm -hmm. uh, Islamic State uh, uh, militants. But I, in my opinion, in the coming hours, maximum one or two days, this issue will be very clarified. I see. And th this probably would not have an effect on, on the policies of the international community that no, are we operating. Saw, we saw uh, French uh, journalists, we saw American and British in the hands of the Islamic State, and we didn't see uh, any, uh, we didn't see any change. Now everybody is waiting to see whether there will be a new policy to the new uh, uh, secretary, uh, defense secretary in the, uh, United, uh, in the United States. For the moment, in spite of the uh, strikes of the international uh, coalition, the Islamic State is resisting and the Islamic State is gaining even uh, more territories. I see. And with Turkey playing this double game exactly. of theirs, it's, uh, it's hard to see how that will change any time soon. Yeah, and it, not, not only in Turkey. Uh, uh, did you know uh, that the Islamic State is fighting in Kobane, but is launching a counterattack in uh, Mosul in order to gain control of the famous uh, barrage? Yeah. Ali, thank you so much. Thank you. Still uh, to come later on the show, African migrants can uh, no longer be detained indefinitely following a unanimous decision by the Israeli cabinet. But first, here are some more of this morning's headlines. We're uh, back. Let's say hello and good morning to Anthony Grant, who joins us daily to discuss the news you missed while scanning the headlines. Do the difficult work for us, Tony. Mm, well, listen, good morning, first of all. Good morning. It's always nice to see you. And I wanted to tell you before we came into the studio that yeah. Facebook is at the center get another controversy, as reported by the Jerusalem Post yesterday. Um, the Israeli Public Security Minister Yitzhak Arnovich has called on Israeli Attorney General Yehuda Weinstein to open an investigation into who posted these photos, mm -hmm. apparently yesterday, of some senior Israeli government officials wearing Nazi garb, um, and it's some kind of a apparent protest against the Jewish state law, which of course has caused some controversy, but this is taking it to another level. Yeah, and it Not does a very uh, good one. throw us back uh, a couple of uh, decades to uh, uh, pictures of uh, Robin in uh, in this uh, uniform, we all know where that went yeah, from there. Yeah, it's very it's very inflammatory to say mm -hmm. the least. And again, um, I think there's such an easy equation these days of anything that's bad, whatever it's like bad food or whatever it's it's Nazi or mm -hmm. you know. And here's another example. So 
um, not not good stuff to no, see. No, and but we should say there, there are several pictures like this. It's not just it's not, uh, no, it's uh, several. Lapid and Livni that, that we've seen yeah, in the pictures. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost yeah. too many dimensions. Right. No, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. so someone had too much time on their hands. Um, on Haaretz was reported a headline which is uh, very uh, interesting and we'll get to, of course, later. But Israel yesterday remembered the Jewish exodus from Muslim lands. Mm -hmm. And uh, November 30th uh, being the official day, the first time that Israel marked uh, the commemoration for Jewish refugees from Arab lands after uh, the 1947 uh, approval of the United UN partition for uh, the Palestine mandate. So big yeah. stuff there. Yeah, in just a little bit we'll have yeah. uh, 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 the initiator of this uh, bill, um, uh, Shimon Hayon, in the studio and he's going to tell us more about it. It's an yeah, interesting it's story. There's an interesting story uh, there. No um, Times of London, kind of a human interest slash political story, very interesting reports that a father rescued a uh, jihadist son from Syria, making headlines in the UK. Um, this is basically um, a father of, uh, of a, like a, I think a 21-year-old kid who basically went to fight for ISIS, and the father basically left his home in Cardiff in Wales, traveled to Turkey managed to get over the border to uh, to Syria and plucked him out of the maw of ISIS and uh, successfully, apparently. So Who bought the rights is what I want to know, yeah, to because, the <laughs> because, because the rights are going to be sold very quickly for this. Yeah, story. perhaps it's an incredible as we speak. story. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it, you, don't, you don't hear a lot of stories like uh, that, of, of that nature regarding what ISIS What happened to them? Uh, what, do we know what happened when they went back to Britain? Um, don't know exactly. Um, I, I, we do know that, uh, that the, his son was one of the, uh, the guys who was appearing in a propaganda the video in June calling on other young Britons to come fight for ISIS so he apparently was already being you know manipulated if you will by uh, the uh, the fighters on the mm -hmm. ground there so it's a good thing he's out it's just certainly a good thing he's out I'm just not sure he's back at home having tea is what I'm saying. Yeah, maybe not yet. I think he's hopefully um, you being know, questioned about what, yeah. about his there's time a lot of there. contacts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of ISIS, uh, this is actually a couple of days over the weekend. But interesting story from, from the Financial Times, mm -hmm. uh, which says ISIS fighters crave snacks and gadgets of the West they disdain. <laughs> It's not a, like a big shocker there, but apparently uh, drinks like Red Bull are a big hit among ISIS um, uh, well, players. When you, when you ask Westerners to, to come to you, they'll bring their uh, they'll bring their stuff with them. Yeah, you know, that, but, that's but what happens. Apparently, they're like addicted to uh, Red Bull Pringles. They prefer Snickers bars and Bounty bars. I mean, it's sort of like when we found out that Osama bin Laden was using Just for Men to color his sideburns. It's not. It's questionable marketing strategy for the companies involved to acknowledge this, but it's being reported. So, it's, it's, I guess it's you know. You know they, you, no, it is worthy. Uh, it's strange. Uh, it's strange, but it shows you this this this. Um, what happens when the world gets too small? Yeah, you know? yeah, that's too small, and maybe there's too much Red Bull flowing in certain yeah, quarters. Yeah, if, if they're like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crazy about Red Bull, then maybe that's the way to, to talk to them. You know, let's yeah, just... you know, um, peace through soda. I don't Something know. Like that. Um, Pope Francis, back in the news, of course, yes. um, after his trip to Turkey, which mm -hmm. he said many things to many people, but he said that the way to fight fundamentalism is by tackling poverty. And again, you know, he has got a point there. Yeah. And it's the question is of, of whether or not people uh, in policy making quarters are actually going to listen to him. But I think he does have a point. Uh, poverty does create so much um, uh, political problems, fundamentalist activity, such as ISIS, you could say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he is trying to hint at here in those in those words. Yeah, to it the certainly Turkish helps uh, uh, the popularity mm -hmm. of of such forces. Yeah, you know, no doubt. And I think you got to love this pope, but I'm I'm not sure that uh, that his voice is heard mm -hmm. enough with with decision makers around the world. You yeah. know, the people love him. But I'm right. not so much. I'm not so sure and that he's he's being taken. I'm seriously. not sure either. Like I love that picture of him with with Erdogan because like each one is looking in a different direction. And you know, here's the guy who actually went to um, have a quiet moment in the blue mosque. You know, uh, he's really um, open-minded, shall we say? Yeah. So other world leaders may not, not so be much. as open-minded. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also in political news, Le Monde and other mm -hmm. uh, papers in France reporting on Saturday night's victory for uh, pres uh, former French President Nicolas Sarkozy, who won the, the leadership of his party, the uh, Union for the Mouvement Populaire, or something, the UMP, well conservative. Pronounced. Thank you. And uh, so he, if he wants to throw his hat into the ring for the 2017 French presidential election, you know, he's on his way. Although it's not a blank check, as this headline kind of seems to say, that it's, he still you know, has quite a bit of campaigning and work to right, do, right. but it shows that he is he's sort of resurgent. He is and he's still quite a popular guy. At least 
testing the water. Yeah, I think he's heading in that direction. And Francois Hollande, of course, is not the world's most popular French president right, uh, not that right now. Not that Sarkozy was uh, uh, not, you he, know. He was polarizing force, but, uh, <laughs> but a lot of people liked him. I mean, I thought he was kind of a cool guy. Um, His wife certainly helped. Carla Bruna Sarkozy, of course, uh, always, always chic and, and artistic. Um, as we have what, time for a story yeah, of the in, Independent. Um, interesting story here about a, a conservative uh, member of parliament who's been sort of criticized over this uh, humorous speech that she made in, um, in the British Parliament in the House of Commons floor. Basically, she's a Navy reservist, and uh, she was doing a tr some training and did a, sort of a faux pas amongst her peers, mostly men, who gave her like a dare to give a speech um, about poultry welfare <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that she could use the abbreviation for the word cockerel as many times as possible and she did <laughs> and it was quite amusing um, but, but not, not to everyone not to everyone mm -hmm. people are saying Parliament is not a reality show and she should have you know minded her P's and Q's so to speak anyway just a little uh, bit of a flap there some laughs uh, I'm yeah. always for that um, and of course uh, this photograph is very uh, making the rounds I think the most pictured the most visible image uh, in recent memory of this Ferguson protest was happening oh, yeah. in Oregon. Uh, a photographer captured, an Oregon photographer captured this image of a, of a young boy there with a cop, and it just has gone, you know, viral beyond oh, yeah, imagination. Well, it's a very powerful, very powerful picture. It's a very powerful yeah. image, and it just it just goes to speak to the, all the different angles and aspects of this uh, of this very tragic and uh, complicated mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a very nice picture, just regardless yeah. of what one thinks about the uh, the situation. And J.C. Penney are having a sale. And J.C. Penney's <laughs> having a sale. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you. It's um, always very interesting stuff. Thanks. See you soon. On to our next topic. African migrants in Israel will have to check in at their holding facilities just once a day, and their stay there will be limited to 20 months. This according to a recent decision by the Israeli cabinet. To break this decision down, see what it really means, we're joined by the legal department director at the Hotline for Refugees and Migrants, Advocate Asaf Weizen. Good morning to you, Asaf. Good morning. So uh, uh, how do you see this decision? as illegal, unconstitutional, and very poor decision. All right, and so I'm guessing you're not for it. <laughs> you guess right. All right, let's, you know, let's, let's go back and, and uh, give us some background, because okay. this decision um, comes in after a, a previous one was thrown out by the Israel Supreme Court. Which came after the previous one was also thrown out. So to make a very long and complicated story as simple and short as I can, we have around 48,000 people that are in Israel, they are black, they are from Eritrea and Sudan, and they cannot be deported to their countries of origin. Not me saying it, not the Supreme Court saying it, the Israeli government is saying mm -hmm. it. Now, the, they are living here for five, six, seven, eight years. You have Mostly to decide. in South Tel Aviv. Mostly in South Tel Aviv, but this is because of government policy that took them with buses from the south, on the border, and put them in the central bus station in south, uh, south parts of Tel Aviv. Now the question is, what do you do with them? Do you keep them in south of Tel Aviv without the ability to, without access to the working market and so on, or you give them a decent treatment and treat them as human beings? Mm -hmm. Now Israel is taking them after years they are living in Israel and putting them in this so-called open detention facility, which is less open than it's it's open. It's just located at a very remote yeah, if someone, place. If the, someone the, doesn't have money, the Cholot uh, the facility Cholot. in the south of Israel. Exactly. The yeah. Cholot, which is in the other side of the road of Saharonim, which is the closed detention facility. Right. Now you take people who are living here, and you know they're working. They have some of them have family, some of them have, have friends and uh, connections with uh, people, and you take them in one day and you put them in this Cholot facility right. for 20 months. Now what do you gain out of it? You pay millions of shekels to support their life there. They are not allowed to work. They mm -hmm. can go out, but where should, would they go out? They don't yeah, have money. There isn't far away. enough working opportunities uh, exactly. uh, around there. So it's 20 months. They are not allowed to work, even if they were mm -hmm. working opportunities. So it's 20 months of pure boredom, which cost the Israeli taxpayer a lot of money. And what do you gain out of it? You make them miserable. Yeah, fine, you got it. But what else? Yeah. So play devil's advocate for us for a second and tell us what does the country think it, it's gaining? Exactly as in many other bad laws that are presented to the Knesset in those, day, those days, a very poor internal politics. Mm -hmm. This is the main issue here. Any new uh, Minister of Interior wants to show that he has a bigger appetite than the other uh, minister before him, Eli Shai, yeah. Gidon Sar, and now we have Gilad Arden. But there is something else. And the Prime Minister said it yesterday in the government's uh, meeting. 
Israel doesn't agree, doesn't accept those people as refugees, mm. doesn't check their request and not do it fairly. But more than this, Israel now wants to deprive them, to take them out of Israel by putting them in a miserable condition. And this is something which is against humanitarian international law and against basic moralities of human beings. I see. This is, is this what they're really trying to do? Is they're trying to uh, warn other asylum seekers, don't come here? Is this they're, what they're it's doing really both. about? They're saying that they need two things. One, to create a normative barrier mm -hmm. that pr will prevent other people from coming. And the second thing is to take the people that are already here without checking their asylum request and send them back. Now, since the border was, the fence in the border was completed in the end of 2012, no one is coming. We're talking yeah. about between zero to five, six people in a month. It's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, let's, let's bring into the conversation uh, over, over the phone from the Cholot uh, uh, facility. Joining us is uh, asylum seeker from Darfur, Mutasim Ali. Good morning to you, Mutasim. Good morning. So give, give me your take on, on this decision, please. All right. Good morning. I saw that in the studio here. You were speaking very well there. Good morning, my friend. Um, and um, I think I um, haven't really much to say about this, as um, we all know that, um, I mean, the, the government's always, always uh, trying mistaken policies, trying failed policies, like the same, repeating the same mistakes. The government doesn't learn from the mistakes like uh, Amendment Number Three, Four, and now we're going to uh, Amendment Number Five. I mean, the only thing that I can say about it, I mean, we understood the government's point of making our lives miserable. We got that point, and trust me, if we have somewhere to go, we would. I mean, we wouldn't stay in Holodaro. I mean, we could. I mean, we, would, we, I mean, we should, would, would live to anywhere else in the planet. But the thing is, we have nowhere to go. I mean. I think there, there, there are better solutions than this. I mean, we know for certain that there are solutions. The government doesn't have to spend a lot of money to, to detain 2,000, 3,000, 7,000, that they know for certain that they cannot deport them back. Right. I mean, even if our asylum requests haven't been, I mean, I mean, we reject it. But at the end of the day, they cannot deport Sudanese and Eritreans. Let's take that fact first. And um, I mean, honestly, uh, if they detain us for 20 months, 20 years, I mean, so what? I mean, we know that we just can't leave. And um, I mean, uh, the government already made this point that making our life miserable, making it harder for us, and we realize that, but seriously, we don't have any way to what, what, kind of, what kind of solution would you like to see to, to the issue? I mean, uh, as I mentioned, that if we take the fact that Sudanese and trans cannot be reported, then uh, I mean, without looking at the asylum request, I think uh, they should be granted um, a, a fair document that um, allow them having a dignified life. And then, uh, I mean, basically they talk about the 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 the, the, the problem in South Tel Aviv. And I think if they got a proper document, nobody would stay there. People will leave and and and, and spread everywhere so, so that they can have dignified life. And then, uh, whenever they get the chance to leave the country, they will leave. Right, right. Mutasim, uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. You know, I just want to say yes, one please. thing about Mutasim. Mutasim, which is a very dear friend of mine, has been ask, trying to ask asylum since 2010. In the end of 2012, he was able finally to ask asylum formally by the government's uh, uh, profile. Yeah. More than this, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees recognized him as a refugee after a full uh, refugee status determination process. Yet, the government didn't make any decision. They didn't say right. he's not a refugee. But they put him in Cholot for a very long time. Actually, the beginning was indefinite time, yeah, and, and at the same time, at the same time, refusing to check his asylum request. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very complicated uh, issue indeed. If you can, very quickly, do you think this decision will hold in court? So I've been asked a lot. I am not a prophet. I don't know. But if you read the, the Supreme Court decisions, you understand this is not standing in what the Supreme yeah. Court said. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Asaf. Thank you. Still uh, to come uh, later on the show, for the first time in its history, Israel marks a national day to commemorate the Jewish exodus from Arab countries. But first, some more of this morning's headlines.
Good morning. Thank you for uh, staying with us. For the first time in its history, the State of Israel sets a national day to recognize the Jewish exodus from Muslim lands. Some 850,000 Jews were expelled, fled, or left their homes in Arab countries around the time of Israel's founding. For many, this day is a belated recognition of their collective trauma to be reconciled in the future. We're joined in the studio by Israeli uh, parliament member from Israel Beitenu Party and the director at the Dahan Center at bar -Ilan University, Dr. Shimon Ochayon. Good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you, too. Also uh, joining us is vice president at the European Jewish Congress and the founding and a founding executive of JJAC, Justice for Jews from Arab Countries, Mr. Edwin Shuker. Good morning to you as well. Thank you for coming in as well. Thank you, Thank you for having us. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from you both. But first, let's uh, watch a report we have on this and uh, come back. A landmark social event in Israel on Sunday as the country, for the first time, pays tribute to Jewish refugees who had to leave Arab countries after Israel was declared a state. As part of the commemoration, special sessions were held at the Israeli parliament devoted to the issue. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin addressed the importance of this recognition for the Israeli public at large. This amendment is especially important in terms of raising public awareness. Among the benefits we are hoping for are that this awareness will heal the past, improve the future, and allow historical justice. Approximately 850,000 Jews were expelled, fled, or left their homes in Arab lands around the time of Israel's founding. Among the countries they left, 30,000 Jews left Libya in 1948. The following year, another 18,000 left Morocco. In 1950, 85,000 Jews left Iraq and 44,000 left Yemen. During the early 60s, another 80,000 Jews left Tunisia. For these refugees, the determination to obtain state recognition is not only ideological. In 1967, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 242 for achieving a just settlement of the refugee problem, aimed at recognizing the rights of the Jewish refugees. Today, on November 30th, 2014, the State of Israel takes the next step forward in officially acknowledging the communities that fled to its territories more than six decades ago and have since called it home. All right, so uh, Dr. Ochayon, let me begin with what may be an obvious uh, uh, question. How come it hasn't happened till now? Well, it's very hard to ask me <laughs> because we took the initiative, but I believe that uh, uh, people were not aware of the situation, people were really m busy. What happened in Europe, mm -hmm. they were under the influence of the Holocaust, trying to save the people of, from Europe. And, and I think this is one of the reasons that the other people, the other part was, you know, forgotten. Left aside. Yes. And uh, the importance of this day to you, is it more on a, on a personal level or is it more uh, uh, the, the matter that this will be now taught, this will now be remembered? I think it's uh, personal and national. It's not only uh, everybody that uh, is really involved feel that I'm part of this uh, nation mm -hmm. and I want that my history, my culture will be part of the Israeli culture. So you can call it Personal, but I see it also national. It's no, not. certainly. It's, uh, so now one. these these stories will be taught in schools. Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. The the law that I passed has, as a matter of fact, three parts. Yes. One, the official ceremony that we like we had yesterday by mm -hmm. the uh, president's house. The second thing, and this for me, is the important thing, the important uh, of. Uh, Ministry of Education to install, to uh, prepare a very, let's I would say, large, expand curriculum in which all the students in the schools, elementary school and high school, will study the history of 50 percent of the population in Israel. Mm -hmm. So that this is the one part. This third part. Because 
currently it is not being taught. It is. Or it yes, is very it is, but, but really very, very little. And the, if it's something that you have to choose, how come something that's really a uh, really main part of your own history that uh, feel that you belong to this nation, mm -hmm. that uh, became something that you have to choose, you want to study it, if you want to concentrate to make, uh, to uh, offer some paperwork and things like this, but I think we have to change it. And we have seen that right yesterday, all the schools in Israel at the same time, at 11 o'clock, at the beginning, they had all, they had, all of them, they, have a, they had a, a lesson that was broadcast all over the, uh, all over the Israel, the state of Israel, mm -hmm. in every school in Israel. This is the beginning. But I believe that uh, we have to work with the Minister of Education to prepare a very uh, nice and large curriculum in order really to unsolve this issue properly. Right. Now you mentioned there are three parts. One is the, and the, the third part is uh, belong to the foreign minister, uh, foreign ministry. Well, don't forget that all these people left behind them, especially in Iraq, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, they left their how their homes, houses, their bank account, their properties, public and personal. Mm -hmm. Everything was taken. Either and we have force. yet to see any, any sort of international... Uh, uh yes, yes, of course, and I believe that also that uh, Dr. Edwin Schoker also is really involved. Before I became also an, uh, a member of the Knesset, I was aware of the uh, activities that were taken by different organizations. Uh, thank God we have now the American Congress that adopted a resolution. The Canadian Parliament already adopted also a resolution that says that Every time, if you try to talk about giving or compensating uh, Palestinian refugees, you have also at the same time to take care of the compensation for the uh, Jewish people from the Arab countries. All right, let's let's uh, turn to uh, uh, Dr. Shukur, who's uh, gladly right here. Um, is that the agenda of the JJAC? Uh, our agenda was, first of all, yesterday was a landmark a watershed for us. We've been working for about uh, nine to ten years now on achieving just that. Why is it important for us in the diaspora that Israel takes such a decision? Because our communities and the international community did not believe us when we came up with these figures. Mm. When we said 856,000 people were refugees, and they said, well, why is Israel not saying anything about it? That's the Jewish organizations and the international organization. Mm -hmm. For us now, Israel has said its word, and yesterday's speech by the president was was exemplary. And I, I today I ask for copies to be translated into as many languages as we can, and to be sent as a, a as a um, achievement that was done through the help and the assistance of uh, M K Shimon Ochayon, M K Nesim Zaev, Uzi Arad, uh, Daniel Yalon, uh, and of course Erwin Kotler and and the activists. The, the, the few dozen activists around the world who took this on and spent the majority of their time over the last 10 years to right. achieve what we've done. Right. So now we have to stop and say, uh, today we actually have an all-day meeting and tomorrow in the Knesset, the whole day in the Knesset, the education, the klita, the plenary, and we are going to now th prepare for the next step. Right. Now, we all know uh, uh, the stories of, of uh, Palestinian refugees who still have the, the key to the, the house in, in Jaffa, in Haifa, wherever it may be. I'm curious if, if the people uh, 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 who, who left their homes in Arab countries have that same feeling. The feeling that they want to go back? That, or the there, feeling is, that there is this home that was left behind that they, Absolutely. they, they need to return to at some point. Especially in the diaspora. It's not returning to their home itself physically. It is actually returning to the Shorashim. It's going to the roots. It's going to where we started from. As we became more comfortable in the wherever we turned out to be, whether it's Europe, whether it's America, we started, our children started asking questions. Mm -hmm. We don't want to tell, I don't want to tell my children that his life began in London in 1991. Yeah. I want to tell him it began 586 BC. And I want to tell him that his ancestors looking for him to continue that 
Yeah. That, that thing. So yes, it is extremely important, more so in the diaspora, I noticed from all our communities, than in, is in Israel, they've got a new state, they're building and all that sort of thing, it's critical, and they will regret it afterwards if they don't do it. Right. But in the diaspora, this is our life, this is our identity, and, uh, and we're not going to give it up easily. Yeah. Yeah. After, I want Please. also to mention that uh, we are talking about a special thing. Here is, there is a history of the Jewish communities that was long for uh, 2,500 years. And everything, in matter of fact, disappeared in 2025 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. 2025 years, the whole, now it's not, <laughs> it's not easy to say it. But these Arab countries are clean of Jews yeah. today. So it Maybe only be, Morocco. It might be lost but not forgotten, because meanwhile the project Sephardi Voices is uh, still ongoing, modeled after uh, Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation, which uh, documented the memories of some 52,000 Holocaust survivors. Similarly, Sephardi Voices, which uh, operates in the US, Britain, and Israel, is filming extensive interviews with the uh, survivors of the forgotten exodus. Uh, so far, 150. 58 have been completed. Edwin right here uh, told his personal story as a part of the project uh, to uh, director Henry Green, who's a uh, um, professor at the University of Miami, if I'm not mistaken. We have a uh, part of the project to see. Let's watch it. Come back. It's our religion. It's our culture. It's something to really be proud of. The mold smell just, a, just hit you in the face. And we could see that everything was in quite bad condition. So there was a lot of damage that had occurred. It was confiscated from the Jewish community starting in 1975 when two intelligence officers came to the center for the Jewish community in Baghdad and decided to confiscate whatever they found there. There was a time when it was thriving. They studied from it and they prayed from it. It's not at all a happy day. Um, it's a very uh, emotional day. All right, so uh, Mr. Chikler, if you, if you may, you were interviewed, uh, as we said, to this project. Can you share your story with us? Well, Savadi Voices is not about the clip you showed. It's about in-depth digital audiovisual uh, scientifically formulated interviews. We're talking here, I was interviewed for four and a half hours. Wow. We're talking about it, what we've done so far is just the beginning. We're testing, we are improving, and we've made deals and for storing these digitally for future generations. Right. We did this with the British Library. We're doing this with the Israeli National Library. Mm -hmm. We're talking here a project that when you compare to Spielberg, we are looking at taking 10,000 to 20,000 interviews in depth, four or five hours each in the next five years. That's the, right. that's the global reach and that's what we're looking for. No, it's a huge undertaking. Completely, but it is so necessary because I think that while the time, it, it, we have a small window of opportunities. I was born and I grew up in Baghdad, mm -hmm. but my son would not be able to give an eyewitness. Right. This, this window and is closing fast. It is closing fast and as you mentioned so rightly, 65 years too late. But it's never too late. We, have, we still can go and do this 10,000 to 20,000 and give the biggest gift to the Jewish people as a whole. For me, this is like the oral Talmud of, of what happened after we wrote the Talmud, after 1,500, what happened in, the, in that time right. since then. Right. And that will be the oral digital way that will be accessible for generations to come. That is wonderful. Unfortunately, I can't give you uh, four and a half hours now, but <laughs> uh, 45 seconds maybe to tell your story. <laughs> uh, yes, 45 seconds is enough. <laughs> I, uh, by the time I, uh, I was born in 1955, the backbone of my community was broken. 125,000 people were displaced, taken without nothing. By the time I was eight, I queued to get a new identity card together with everybody else. This identity card was exclusively Jewish. Mm -hmm. It was yellow. Mm -hmm. It marked me at eight years old as somebody who is does not belong, an alien. Yet we were not allowed to leave. We were actually hostages until we escaped in 1971. Nice. In the meantime, I lost my childhood. I saw people being hung in public squares, and I I saw torture and I saw uh, human rights being abused. But today I'm here, we are living here. We, we said Shekhianu yesterday, and we are yeah. grateful for I-24 for giving us this time. I just I wanted to add also Please. that the Minister of uh, Senior Citizens, 
mm -hmm. here in Israel, is uh, conducting a project, a national project, in which he's inviting in matter all the communities, everyone, to tell his story. And they are working together with students in the schools and uh, everybody, everybody from Libya, from Egypt, from Morocco is invited to sit down and to write his story. That's part of the archives that we have right yeah, now, yeah. besides all the documents that are talking about yeah. the properties. Very, very important uh, project indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ochan, for coming in. Thank you, Mr. Schiffer, as well. Thank you Thank you very much. Still uh, coming up later on the show, we mark the World AIDS Day. But first, some more of this morning's headlines. Good morning, thank you for staying with us. Back in the studio is Anthony Grant, who's here now for the web review, mm. the crazy viral spiral that is the web review. Well, no? yeah. yeah, craziness. You know, <laughs> I, I got here this morning by uh, car um, to Jaffa, and I did not use the Uber ride-sharing service. Have you used Uber, the ride-sharing service? I have not used Uber, the... the uh, um... Ride-sharing service. Exactly. Well, maybe you should try <laughs> Schlepp. Schlepp. Yes, it's the ride-sharing service for <laughs> Jewish mothers brought to you by um, Elite Daily. This is on YouTube. We have a clip. It's making the rounds. All right. Yeah, let's see if we can see it. Schlepp, the first on-demand car service that uses Jewish geography navigation. It's very simple. You click request Schlepp and the nearest car will come pick you up 15 minutes late. The Schlepp driver will let you know when they've arrived. Let's go. I'm in a hurry. Come on. <laughs> chop, chop. Get in. <laughs> Uh, and <laughs> then also, along the way, does she ask you, why haven't you married yet? Yeah, when well, am I going to see the grandkids? Can you already? stop at the cleaners and pick up my clothes? Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, there's a, it, the, I recommend watching the, the whole thing. It's, it's quite amusing. It's, it's not a real service, I have to. Oh, it's it's uh, imaginary. But I'm, it, I'm very disappointed. Yeah, but it uh, gives Jewish mothers everywhere an idea of how to make a little e income on the side, actually. And I think it's very funny. Yeah, it's great stuff. And of course, <laughs> You know, Uber itself and, is... You know, they, they can expand it. I mean, you can also, like, get some, some uh, chopped liver along the way. Mm. And there's like... Huh. I'm coming out soon, schlep for Drews. But that's, a, <laughs> that's taking it to another level. Um, anyway, fun stuff. Um, let's go back. Actually, it's still on the audiovisual note. Lars von Trier dropped a bombshell the other day by saying he worries he won't be able to make movies now that he's sober. Really? Yeah. Now, apparently, he what made... What was he on? He was what on vodka. wasn't he on? Well, he basically said that he used to go drink a bottle of vodka a day in order to enter a parallel universe in which he was able to create. He's so, so weird. He, I, I love mean, him. I love him. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I love um, the guy. you love all of his movies? In, no, I mean, Dogville? I don't. Of yeah. course not. I, I the, try not to watch them uh, uh, um, yeah. ever since um, binge Dancer in the Dark. Yeah. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm keeping a safe distance. Binge watching Lars von Trier could put mm. one in the parallel universe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with or without vodka. Uh, but maybe I'll try his method with a bottle of vodka to watch the film. Maybe that's how maybe it's that's done. Maybe that's how it's supposed, supposed to, watch to be done. Yeah. Maybe. Something like now, that. I mean, maybe now he can make a different uh, feelings that won't make you want to, to slit your wrists. You know? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. maybe Bjork will come back into his fold of uh, potential, you know, I don't know, actors. Wow. Who knows? A lot of stuff. Interesting stuff there. Uh, but not as controversial Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. Okay. Um, we know that he had this bombshell confession that during his uh, hashtag uh, I am sorry art show a few months ago in LA, he apparently was raped. Or he started to be raped by a woman who was uh, partaking of the show, but uh, the woman was, the, the in, there was an intervention and it was stopped by a couple of these artists that have now actually come out and said that they that they kind of intervened and prevented it from actually happening. I mean, you're making a face. He he's, no, he's okay to... with it. I mean, he's 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 sort of he's not he's not sort of making um, a federal case out of it, if you will. Right. But he is talking about it, and it is a little bit strange. It is strange, but there's I think there's very little happening with Shia LaBeouf that in the not... last I don't know two years that isn't that isn't strange. Yeah, you have to wonder: is this just something made up, you know, to grab headlines, or is it actually tr true? It does appear to be some truth to it. But if um, other people are are, yeah, um, a, a British artist Luke Turner and a Finnish artist um, uh, not. 
Natasha or something uh, Ron well, went on Twitter to say that they could still be some sort of. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't yeah. know if I if I should even say that it could be a PR stunt because there who are, knows? It's Shia yeah, LaBeouf. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> um, also controversial uh, in the art world in Paris. I don't know if you heard about the so-called. It, quote unquote human zoo exhibit. Um, this I is, have not. Uh, okay. Well, actually, this is um, basically something that's in a little. It's not in a huge museum in Paris, but it's this, this South African artist. His name is Brett Bailey, and he has like twelve uh, tableaux vivants, which uh, are meant to sort of show the um, the bad things about colonialism in the past. Mm. But people have taken it the wrong way in Paris and have actually tried to physically stop this art uh, exhibit from happening, it's had no problems anywhere else in Europe. So but why in Paris? I would, well, I would imagine that they'd be... Uh, in avant-garde Paris? Uh, well, you know, Paris uh, is also a very traditional city on many levels, and so a lot of people didn't take a, a shine to something that uh, was a flashback to real human zoos mm -hmm. back in, mm -hmm. I don't know, 100 years ago or something, when people from exotic places were put behind uh, sort of display, display right. cases or whatever. Right. So it's pretty controversial there. Um, it's going it on look, until uh, next week. It doesn't look it's visually uh, uh, pleasing, though. It's, it's interesting the way he set it up. I mean, and it's meant to, you know, cause one to reflect on yeah. history. And, yeah. But people are very divisive stuff. Um, very quickly, Kendall Jenner has uh, pulled a Kim Kardashian in that pose, which is making the rounds on the internet just in time for Christmas. It is it's, December 1st. I'm Has she gone too far for a 19-year-old? She's 19. Wow. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's um, yeah, you know. the Christmas. I'm not sure it's in line with the Christmas spirit, you know, with the holiday yeah, yeah. spirit. Yeah, Well, you know, if she's trying to sell lingerie, then it'll work. Um, two Madonna songs have been leaked on the internet. Of course. Um, and this is a billboard, uh, Rebel Heart and Wash All Over Me, apparently. So it's, again, was it done on purpose or was it really an accidental leak? We don't know. Do we, you know, yeah, we don't know, but it's always, it always comes from somewhere, and that uh, it's always, you know, close enough to the release date. It always creates yeah, some sort yeah. of buzz. A little buzz, a little yeah. buzz. Um, of course, speaking of Madonna, um, and it's hard not to think of the uh, the work that she's done over the years, the Jean Paul Gaultier. Mm -hmm. Jean Paul Gaultier is in on some artistic endeavors in commemoration of uh, World AIDS Day, which, of course, is today, December 1st. Um, Jean-Paul Gaultier and Manolo Blahnik are creating artistic East Pack backpacks for World AIDS Day. There's one of them pictured. Um, these are for um, for for charitable uh, cause, obviously, to to fight AIDS. Uh, these are uh, there are 16 uniquely customized backpacks, which are going to be auctioned today on EastPack.com with the for the charity Designers Against AIDS. Interesting, it's very artsy nice stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah, very nice stuff. If you and like for backpacks a very, and for a good cause. It's, Absolutely, uh, I'm bidding. Sure, yeah. why not? That one looked kind of cool. Yeah, um, I liked it. Madonna, of course, uh, is uh, also uh, supporting um, the uh, in her effort for World AIDS Day. This is the uh, the the uh, the red um, campaign, which is you you can um, basically uh, download a number of apps, and part of the proceeds will go to the fight against AIDS. A lot of celebrities are sort of jumping on that uh, activity. Yeah, it's and been ongoing. Apple we've seen as well. Yeah, Apple has, lighting uh, up their logo red in uh, I think Sydney. Uh, and uh, which is, you know, kind of a dramatic gesture, but uh, I mean, symbolic, I should say. Mm -hmm. And other stores around the world will follow. So yeah, that's and we've be seen the, the app store uh, uh, pretty much taken over by by uh, uh, this campaign. Uh, very good cause, yeah. and um, hopefully it'll achieve some things. Uh, thank yeah. you so much, Tony. Thank you. And uh, Kevin Kirsch is here. Usually, uh, she's joining us to speak about uh, uh, feminine issue, feminine news. Um, today, we're going to tie it in with the World AIDS Day. Yes. Uh, good morning. Yes, we are <laughs> tying it in. I, I wanted to jump in before, but I, uh, you know, I held myself. Okay. Um, You're always welcome to jump in when, mm -hmm. when at least when yeah. I'm here. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you. Well. Women are a very, very central issue in the fight against AIDS right now. Uh, in the world today, there are 35 mi million people w living with HIV, mm -hmm. the vast majority in poor countries such as Africa. And in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, women are twice as likely uh, to catch HIV as men. Than they are in the Western world. Um, then they are, it's more, but right. worldwide, uh, the, uh, AIDS is the number one killer among women ages 15 to 44. The number one killer. Wow. 
Okay. That is that um, is uh, an incredible statistic, especially since in in recent years we've we've come to think of AIDS as uh, um, a disease that is um, staying in the past, that is manageable now. That well, you know what was so scary uh, a decade ago is now something that yeah, sure you should you know try to avoid and, and watch yourself. But if God forbid something happens and you get it you could still live a normal life. The, there is a very, very big difference. First of all, these huge numbers are, of course, also very much affected by places such as Africa. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think that that is the biggest challenge that the, the AIDS uh, fighting or the HIV fighting community is facing. Um, it's to find in the Western world the delicate balance between raising awareness mm -hmm. and prevention and on the other hand, not awake stigma for people who already have contracted the virus and are living with it and, and to sort of um, not make them an, an outlawed community. And that's a very complicated balance. Mm -hmm. and, and when it comes to women, it's even more complicated because women don't have at the moment uh, contraceptives that they can use, such as condoms, uh, in a discreet way, right. in a way that will not raise uh, suspicion on, on their partner's behalf. And right now, there, there are uh, two of these are already about uh, to be experimented in Africa next year. Uh, two experimental, one is some, some kind of pill and the other is some kind of gel. And, and by 2015, we will know if these work. And if these work, they can really, really bring about change because... Yeah, it is very important because women are, even on a biological level... Yes, they, they're... Are, they are more, uh, more sensitive to the virus, more vulnerable to yeah. it, on, on two levels, both biologically and, and by not being able to, to protect themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they contract it in, in other ways. And, of course, they can pass it on to their children. Although that is something that, that in Europe and in America is already um, child, uh, children born to women who are carriers are already being born in many, many cases without the virus. That is because they are treated yes. before the, the, yes. while the pregnancy is, uh, is uh, ongoing, yes. they're yes. treated. For, uh, they, they but are, again, in Africa, this is a problem that, that isn't being addressed as seriously and, as it and does they, in the And West. it can't be. It's not, you know, it's, it's a forces thing. Uh, AIDS might be the first epidemic that will have a cure. A mm -hmm. cure, mm -hmm. not not a, a manageable solution. Well, Ebola is already lined up behind it to, to yes. take its place. So yeah. you know, it's not like our problems will be solved. But but what we can learn from this is that um, addressing the women's issue in it, w without addressing the women's issue in it, it will not be solved. Right, right. Uh, the, the population of women needs to be particularly cared for yeah. and and given specific solutions. But in general, we do see uh, um, fewer cases of AIDS worldwide. Yes, we are seeing a decrease, although not everywhere. In Israel, for instance, last year in 2013, there were 10 cases less mm -hmm. than the year before. Mm -hmm. it's, not so it's not a, a major... It's not a major change. Right. And like you said, the, um, the um, effects of it being considered already like a chronic disease and something that you can live with is that uh, the, some of the populations at risk, the ones who are more aware perhaps, um, uh, homosexual population, are, we are actually seeing an increase. Really? In Europe, in Israel, in the U.S., that people are sort of, you know, because they're getting to uh, uh, care nonchalant, I yeah. guess, about it. Uh, it's a, you and know. this is following uh, uh, some changes we've seen that, that, for instance, homosexuals can now uh, uh, give blood, uh, which was a problem uh, in in previous years because of the uh, fear of, of yes. HIV. Uh, also, you know, we're seeing we're seeing that people who live with HIV, HIV, not AIDS, of course. Right. Um, can can live a life and are are considered a population that needs to be protected against discrimination and stuff and and that's something it's it's really a tricky thing for uh, for all the AIDS uh, organizations everywhere that you see these campaigns of people hiding the fact that they're ca HIV carriers mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and treat us like normal people on one hand and on the other hand we're trying to say be careful this yeah. is dangerous yeah. it's still an illness it's still a disease. Yeah. Um, so how how will uh, the world uh, mark the, the the World AIDS Day? Well, well, the world is there. There are quite a number of events besides the sales and the auctions and the raising money. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, the, in Israel. There's a, a rock uh, concert uh, today. Um, uh, the Apple uh, Red campaign. There's mm -hmm. really really a lot of work uh, done this during this whole week, and also marking what the UN AIDS organization the global goal, and that's a very ambitious goal, but they've 
they've put it already, that in five years, by 2020, 90 percent, uh, it's called the 90-90-90 goal, 90 okay. percent diagnosis, 90 percent treatment, and 90 percent elimination wow. of the AIDS uh, worldwide. worldwide. That is a, a, a pretty, um, I don't know, astonishing goal. If, if it will be achieved, it will be uh, quite a success. It will be quite a success, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm starting to be optimistic about this thing because uh, really the resources are put in and, and there are task forces and, and presidential uh, you know task forces also and money put into it and who knows maybe we can we'll be able to learn from it uh, maybe. it took, it took yeah, 30 well, something you know, I'm, years I'm looking at the at the events that that are held yeah. there's something in the white house and there's also something with with former playboy playmate uh who's uh, living with hiv and if you have Playboy on your side, I think then uh, definitely it will be achieved, no problem. Of course, of course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you uh, uh, so much, Karen. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony. So thank you. Thank you at home for uh, joining us uh, this morning as well. I hope you enjoyed watching our show. We'll be back tomorrow with another morning edition. Until then, you're welcome to visit our website, i24news.tv. See our previous shows and other magazines that we're offering, from culture to sports to economy. And of course, The Tube, which deals with the online matters. We'll be back tomorrow, as I said. Until then, every hour, every half hour, there's a news bulletin to get you the latest updates. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.